march in a small platoon. Let's march back to the cartoon. In 1993, Nickelodeon cut their 65 episode order of their first animated series, Doug, short, letting it end at 52 very early the next year. Creator Jim Jenkins still had plans for the colourful world of Bluffington, bumper sticker capital of the world, however, and his production company, Jumbo Pictures, didn't let go of hope the show would return. In 1996, it would seem their prayers were answered when Disney decided to buy them out, they would make their own 65 brand spanking new episodes of Doug, while Nick kept the older 52, and air them on a major network they owned, ABC, in hopes that these adventures would reach a wider audience and become more popular than ever before. They only did the first thing right. Many fans of the series have criticised Disney's Doug over the years for not being as funny or charming as the Nickelodeon run. And this sentiment isn't just shared by fandom, the crew members also view much of it as an inferior product. Constance Shulman, the voice actress for Patty Mayonnaise, said Disney's way of recording wasn't as intuitive as Nick's, and Doug and Roger's original voice actor, Billy West, proved unavailable, and has gone on record saying he has a hard time watching this era of the show. He's also said the original was his favourite show he ever worked on, so if you want a fan's perspective, look no further. Even the creator, Jim Jenkins, understands why fans didn't like it, but you can still feel some of his creative touch in it, even if it is very faint. I'll consider Disney's Doug a different show from Doug, because legally it is. It's not like ABC could randomly decide to air a Nick episode someday or vice versa, they had ownership of different portions of the franchise. Although Disney still has the power to make more Doug content, but has chosen not to do so. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Why Disney wanted Doug in the first place is hard to figure out, but it could be they were testing the waters for their own slice of life platform, the one Saturday morning block. Whereas the classic Disney afternoon block was more fantastical and filled with cartoony cartoons, average everyday kids were a more common sight on ABC Saturday mornings between 1997 and 2002. Who knows, if Disney never got its gloves on Doug, we might not have Recess or Pepper Ann, among others. You kids have some funky fresh moves. When Disney's brand spanking new Doug premiered on September 7th, 1996, fan reception was mixed. Some were excited to see their favourite characters on network television rather than cable, while others, as previously mentioned, couldn't get over the changes in tone, production and story, which will be mentioned eventually. How well did it do? It seemed to start strong, proving to Disney they could make slice-of-life shows, but petered out as those other shows hit the scene and usurped Doug. It went on hiatus after a very short season 2, then spat out a very long season 3 to just get it all out, ending on June 26th, 1999, as just a footnote in Disney television history, and the bearer of a critically panned theatrical movie. And since then, Doug has been in limbo. Why does every Nickelodeon show I have to review end on a sad note? There's something wrong with this company, I think it was built on a Native American burial ground. I'll cut the chatter here and actually review Disney's Doug now. I've been stalling because I have a harder time reviewing shows I don't like than shows I like. Indeed, I don't like Disney's Doug. Not because it's a bad show at all, but because it's just Doug again, but worse. You've changed, Skeet. The old Skeeter would have said, yeah, cool man, whatever you say, Doug. I'm going home. See ya. Okay, cool man, whatever you say, Doug. America's favorite 11 and a half year old, Doug Funny, is turning 12 at the start of the new school year, which is at a new middle school that'll still be under construction when they start. What a safe environment. Since he seemingly spent the whole summer in his room, however, he hasn't caught up with all the latest goss from his friends. Connie went to weight loss camp and has less of a personality aside from liking electric guitar. The Honker Burger's been redone as a fancy French restaurant, so the gang now has to go to a place called Swirly's, which is pretty much no different apart from the exterior. Roger's family's rich now, so he has no reason to still be a trailer park type of bully. The Smash Adams series has taken on a more comedic approach, which is never brought up again after this. Doug notices his voice has started to change, so he sounds more dopey than quirky. The beats have broken up, and keep reforming and splitting over the show over stupid things, which is really sad and confusing. Patty is now homeschooled for English classes, 
which has little bearing on any future plots and is later redacted. The Funny Parents are expecting another baby, Cleopatra Dirtbike Funny, because that's what every show needs to do to keep the audience's attention organically. And shock of the century, Skeeter's arms are longer. Pretty much all of these changes are for the worse. They miss the point of the little nuances in the original show, and worst of all, they all happen in the best episode of the Disney run. Yeah, I'm not joking, episode 1 was my favourite this time around. I think it tells a cold but fair story about letting go of the past and embracing change. Whether intentionally or not, it captured that frustration and personal turmoil successfully, and swung the door open for more stories well enough, I guess. But the following 64 episodes tried a little too hard to keep the characters interesting. Doug should be a little smarter, being a little older, but I noticed him making the wrong decisions more often, and retreating into his fantasies more instead of fixing the problem first. It doesn't help that Smashed Adams and Race Canyon were retired, leaving Quail Man as his only alter ego, and the more general fantasies have gotten more reference heavy. This show's very lucky stuff like the X-Files and the Magic School Bus are still recognised. Porkchop's still the most entertaining character, but they use him a lot less, the tween drama was more important it seemed. Skeet didn't change much, but for some reason they found making him intrigued with a lake monster in the Lucky Duck Lake was a good idea. I mean, it's fine, but you don't need to make a whole movie out of it or anything. He hangs out with the Sleech brothers Alan Moo while doing so, and they are so irritating in this show. Whatever mystery surrounding them quickly left when they hit puberty and just became annoyingly bitter geeks. They also get a dog who doesn't fit the Doug art style at all, so can you blame them for thinking it's an alien? Patty Mayonnaise isn't quite as sweet as she was in the Nick show, but they did a better job of exploring her life than the other characters. I couldn't feel her relationship with Doug going anywhere meaningful though, and I'll get to why that might be soon enough. BB is still a spoiled rich girl, but we get to see more of her, because the junior high school is eventually named and shaped after her. Why not? Roger Klotz also kind of tries to fill in a rich kid role, which I guess was an attempt to give him more larger than life ideas and troubles, but they didn't do a whole lot with it. There are some new kids at BB Bluff Junior High, and I'm not too crazy about them. First is Guy Graham, head of the school newspaper team. He has charisma, arguably more than any other character in the franchise, but making him another jerk to Doug wasn't very efficient, since they had Roger for that, or at least used to. They introduced Skunky too, a laid-back dude bro who isn't very smart, but embodies the 90s well enough to make Doug feel more up-to-date with the attitudes of the era. That doesn't make him super interesting, but he had a reasonable use. There's a few more teachers. Some of the older school faculty was retired, Miss Wingo unfortunately, Mr. Bone thankfully, and Mr. Shellacki who I forgot to mention. We don't talk about Mr. Shellacki though. In their place, there's this obnoxious army guy who's the new music instructor, a far more extravagant English teacher who brings some much needed energy to certain episodes, and two engineering teachers who look the same but talk and act completely different. That's a fun gimmick, and they were criminally underutilized. A lot of the other characters stayed the same, if not getting a bit more annoying. Doug's mother has a higher voice, Judy's a bit more pretentious, etc. But still, it's commendable they could keep my attention at all with this radiated dead zone of the Tintin universe. But enough about graphic novels. How about plain old novels? Disney's Doug is filled with literary references. Moby Dick, Animal Farm, the works of Bill Shakey. I feel like this show wants its younger viewers to learn alongside the pre-teens it stars. But who looked at this and said, this is great, but where's the Orwellian subtext? That's another difference. Most of the cast doesn't act much older, but their conflicts are. Patty and her gal pals worry about their weight in one episode, leading to Patty becoming anorexic. Connie seriously considers dropping out of school to start a career in music. These give everyone a Founders Rules for rock superstardom! We follow all 50 and we can't lose! Rule number 34. And Doug starts going bald. The Charlie Brown similarities never stop coming. But about that episode, Doug's hairy situation, it has the creepiest exchange I've ever seen in a 90s Disney cartoon. 
with a bold guy at the barber suggesting Doug would look more sexy if he shaved it off. But Doug, if you're worried that people won't like you because you've lost some hair, hey, that's their loss. Because you're still the same person. You're only sexier. Who wrote this episode? <laughs> ah, it's a small world after all. But when faced with moral dilemmas, Doug still does what any good Christian boy would do and asks himself one simple question. What would Quail Man do? As the series goes on, there are more Quail Man-centered episodes, most using Doug's real problems as a framing device, but a few don't even do that. And since they take up a bulk of each episode they're in, you have to visit Quail World for at least 15 minutes, and if superhero parody isn't your cup of tea, or you still miss the other alter egos from the next series, they're going to frustrate you quickly. Jim Jenkins was considering making a full-fledged Quail Man series, but Disney shot the idea down, so that's why they made 13 of these things in Season 3. There are some pretty good Quail Man episodes, but the genre-savvy jokes and stock super plot lines got old towards the end. Still, they can sometimes be a lot of fun, even better than the Nickelodeon Quail Man episodes sometimes. Another thing I would say is better in this run is the presentation. The animation is a bit more clean and vibrant, and the music is more orchestrated. I think they hit a good balance between a cappella and instruments this time. But if you want to see this in their best quality, again, Disney Plus is your only option sadly. Home video releases are limited, even back in the day, so you have to take my word that it looks better than this. And despite the methods of voice recording changing, I can still tell everyone's putting their all into it, even the infamous cast changes for Doug and Roger. I prefer Billy West by A Country Mile, but Thomas McHugh and Chris Phillips aren't terrible, they're just ten times more unlikable is all. Not a lot of differences between seasons this time around, there are small story arcs scattered across each one though. Season 1 has Doug's dad wanting to give him the talk, which had a small but kind of funny ending. I learned all that stuff in school. You did? Yeah, sure. That was really informative. <laughs> I guess they left a few things out when I was a kid. Season 2 is where Skeeter begins the hunt for the Lucky Duck Lake monster, and... So let's give a giant man welcome to your new vice principal, Mr. Lamar Bone! <laughs> Mr. Bone? Uh, the one good change you made! And Season 3 sees Doug's sister Judy moving on to college and Patty's dad hooking up with her English teacher. They add something to those characters at the very least. Other macro arcs, like the former mayor being demoted to principal, fail to have interesting beginnings and resolutions. If you didn't watch the original show, you wouldn't find the joke as funny, nor would you understand half the callbacks they make. Now since there's less stories, on account of them shifting to a half hour format, I'll just do a top eight and bottom six this time around. The format didn't work all the time, but it didn't fail all the time either. Starting with my eighth favorite, Doug's Brain Drain. This is another one of those cases where the absurd fantasies are what make it so funny. I couldn't remember much of what actually happens, it just felt like the more surrealist writers wanted to show their work. Night of the Living Dugs isn't as good as the previous Halloween specials, but again, the absurdity of it sells it to me. What if everyone around you looked and acted the exact same? Well, for Doug, that's a nightmare world. And a very funny one, pun intended. Doug's Big Panic is a pretty fun stage play episode about a school production where Leonardo da Vinci falls in love with the Mona Lisa. Guy's the main performer, Patty's the supporting role, and Doug's the understudy, so expect some teasing. Patty's dad dilemma takes itself way more seriously than the others. Patty finds out her dad and teacher are dating, and misses her older mother. It's pretty heavy-handed, but they did a good job of developing all these characters. Doug's bloody buddy makes for another pretty great Halloween special, with everyone convinced that Skeet is a vampire due to a series of misunderstandings. Sure, it's not a good sign when a wacky misunderstanding is my fourth favorite, but there are valid reasons for Doug to think his best friend is a blood-sucking monster. Doug's minor catastrophe is about a drug craze, I'm not kidding. The kids get hooked on adult candies with a weirdly named chemical with harmful side effects. It's a good story about peer pressure, but notice how most of my favorite episodes are the edgier ones. Quail Man 6, The Dark Quail Saga, was the first of the Disney Quail Man episodes, 
and had the most to say and do with its premise of a dark quail wrecking things. It might not seem as good by the end of the show because these jokes are repeated across 13 other episodes, but it's a lot funnier than most other Doug episodes. I've already been over why Doug's last birthday, the first episode, is my favourite of the Disney run, so let's go straight to the worst, shall we? Doug's best buddy introduces Bobby Budingo, an old friend of Doug's and one I deliberately forgot about until now because he's so damn annoying. He ruins Doug's life for a very long time, and the silver lining of him acting slightly more mature in the end is like an ice pack on a sword off arm. It doesn't help. Patty and Skeeter have a falling out in Doug in the Middle because a parrot blurts out their secrets. Doug has to mend things over, but spends around four minutes going back and forth between them at Swirlies, wasting his and my time and not progressing anything. Quail Man and the LUB is not a good substitute for Avengers Endgame. All the kids have superhero alter egos now, fair enough, but this fantasy has almost no impact on the outside story of Judy messing with a junior high stage play. Then not. Thanks for spending my time on foot powers. Doug's hot dog sees Doug adopt this walking birthday card, and very quickly he and his family ignore Porkchop in favour of it. Alan Moo adopted in the end, but like the babysitter episode last time, I'm not happy for either party in this scenario. I can't believe how stupid Doug is in Doug's dream house. Patty has to stay over, and he does literally everything wrong. If I were Patty, I'd either not talk to him for a week after this, or start to take pity on him. He's still a kid, but he shouldn't be acting this clumsy. But the worst episode was Doug on the Road. I could go on this big thing about it, but it's getting close to the end of the year, so a worst list of all these shows is in order, and I don't want to waste my energy on this thing twice in a matter of months. I'd rather review Doug's Hail Mary, a director video movie that became a theatrical movie for no reason on March 26th, 1999, Doug's first movie. A Valentine's Day school dance is approaching, and Doug really wants to work on it with Patty. He doesn't get to, blame Guy. Meanwhile, Skeeter finally discovers the Lucky Duck monster, but it turns out to be a harmless, friendly creature that's been heavily mutated by Mr. Bluff, BB's dad, who does bad, rich business stuff. Doug and Skeet, with the help of Mayor Dink, almost reveal it to the world through a news conference, but Doug notices that the reporters have weapons, so he instead tries to disguise the monster as a kid. This went off the rails very quick, wouldn't you say? That's the biggest problem with the movie. It doesn't know if it wants to be akin to an average Doug Holiday special, or this big wacky adventure that bends the rules and takes it to new heights. I mean, it's fun at times. I appreciate that the literary references fit here more. When Doug nicknames the monster Herman Melville, then is disguised Hermione. Not that it adds or subtracts anything from the robotic nanny or the inexplicable interspecies romance, if you were to take this as the end of Doug, it's a strange ending, but I won't lie, it's a memorable one. As for Jim's plans for a potential follow-up to Doug, some of the details sound promising, like aging the cast up and focusing on adult life, while others are bound to upset longtime fans even more, namely his word that Doug and Patty never become anything more than friends. His reason is that first crushes don't usually last into adulthood, which is a brutally honest perspective that I can see. As for where and when these new ideas will materialize, well, Cartoon Network hasn't had a turn with this hot potato of a series, give them a shot with it. As for how I feel about Disney's Doug, I thought it was pretty average. Not a great addition to the franchise, but I wouldn't call it a bad show. It's still got a simple charm and noticeable moral standard to it, and there's something to be said about a series like this starting off competing with these shows and just barely living long enough to compete with these ones. A different set of kids had their own Doug to watch, and if you look at it that way, Disney's Doug did no harm. But the Nick one has outlasted it in reruns. While Disney scrubbed Disney's Doug from their image by the end of 2004, the Nickelodeon series still shows up on their retro programming blocks to this day. And honestly, that's where it belongs, as a throwback to a more innocent, opportunistic time. Doug could not be made today, because there'd be no way to sell it to a network without adding some gimmicky element to make it stand out. But I see it as the animated equivalent of vanilla ice cream, 
that's about as plain as you can get while still having a subtle flavour, and sometimes it's nice to sit back, relax, and enter a world that's completely reliable with no strings attached. It isn't one of my favourite cartoons, but I respect how different it feels, and wish more media these days was this easy to enjoy with no worry. It may not look like it, but Doug, both versions, is one of a kind. Goodbye for now. Who's that Pokemon? Okay.